On this day, a prominent Muslim leader in the Western world, Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz, better known as Malcolm X, rahimahullah, was assassinated and made shaheed, inshallah. So this week on Islam 21C, keep an eye out for some amazing content from our inspiring and empowering authors and contributors. Here's a short reflection on Malcolm X, rahimahullah, from educationist and history specialist Abu Bakr Madan al-Shabazz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers and sisters. I'd like to address the topic of Malcolm X. I think it's an important topic for us because it's coming up to the anniversary of his assassination and also what type of changes he made within society. So one of the first things I want to lay is the foundation where Malik Shabazz or Malcolm X was born in 1925 on May the 19th in the state of Nebraska. Nebraska at the time was a one of those clan states. So a lot of uh, people from the Ku Klux Klan had migrated to uh, areas like Nebraska. A lot of that was to do with the industrialization that was taking place in the east and northern parts of America. But what also accompanied that was that within the United States of America, racial segregation was legal. And this happened after the Plessy versus Ferguson case in the late 1890s whereby it was said that black people and white people would be legally segregated. And this is where they came with this concept of separate but equal. But that became a fast much later on because there was more opportunities and advantages for people who were from European descent. So Malcolm's mother was Louise. She came from Grenada. She was um, African Caribbean, who had come to United States of America, where she met Earl Little, who she ended up marrying, and they ended up between themselves having seven children together. So Malcolm was one of seven children. Now, one of the important things with the little family at the time was that his mother Louise and Earl, they were part of the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was established by a Jamaican black nationalist and pan-Africanist by the name of Marcus Garvey. Now, Marcus Gavi had a few basic principles within his movement. He believed in self-reliance, you know, uh, continued education, upward mobility, and trading with the African continent. So these are some of the principles or the identifying factors with the Gavi movement. And Malcolm's mother, Louise and Earl, they were writers, but she was the main writer, so she was an educated woman. So when he was 17 years old, he ended up migrating to New York City where his sister Ella lived. She was a, she was a rich woman uh, in real estate and she was part of the Nation of Islam too. Now the reason why I mention Nation of Islam because Malcolm did not know about the Nation of Islam as a movement or an ideology, you know, until he went into prison. And then he found out that some of his own siblings were part of that movement. So while he was in prison, he had educated himself. And from that education, he developed as an individual. He read a lot of books on history, geography, genetics. He looked at the element of miscegenation, you know, the element of mixed race elements through time and space. He also looked at theology as well. So he looked at many, many different uh, topics while he was in prison. Why I mention the prison? Because this is where this transformation really takes place, because the American society had failed him, as well, obviously with racial segregation, you know, he didn't really want to be a waiter, the stereotypical roles. While he was in school, he actually wanted to be a lawyer, but he was dissuaded by his teacher, who was of Polish extraction not to go into that. It was unrealistic for him to go into that. It's better for him to become a carpenter. So it was these type of notions and ideals that white America had for black America. But Malcolm was far beyond this. Unfortunately, he got into the gangster world when he moved to New York because this is what was expected of black men to do during that particular period. Uh, dating white women. Um, many of them were married at the time. You know, he mentions this is an autobiography. So you can see the CD element of an urban culture or an urban society or a cosmopolitan society. This is what Malcolm grew up in. 
Now, I want to focus on his education because I think this is important because Islam teaches us about the importance of knowledge and it's, it's obligatory as well on males as well as females for us to educate ourselves. Education is the key, not just to knowledge, which opens up the doors to wisdom, but it's also something which could uh, navigate us within life, you know, on choices that we make, you know, decisions we make, etc. So these things are, are quite important. And what was important to Malcolm while he was in prison was to educate as much as he can. This is when he came into um, a relationship with the Nation of Islam. That had crystallized around about 1930, 1931, when Robert Poole, who became... Um, you know, Elijah Muhammad, okay, took over the movement from uh, Farad Muhammad, who was of Asian extraction, maybe from the Pakistan, Punjab region of what was known as India, you know, at that time before the partitioning took place. So the things which I want to leave you with, the importance is the effects and the impact that Malcolm had. He was very articulate. He got straight to the point, And he was the one which actually painfully reminded white America of their hostile treatment towards black people. He was part of the civil rights movement in a sense, but he focused more on human rights. The, f the fact of being a human, because... Round about the 1770s, it was already um, understood by the so-called founding fathers that black people would be three-fifths of a man. They didn't even think of women at the time. So this was the type of aspects that were in uh, the society that Malcolm himself was in, challenging just to be a human being, uh, elements of upward mobility, and for better treatment you know, from the white system. But what I want to leave you with, because Malcolm's story is really, really long, and I think it's good just to maybe summarize a few points of importance in order for us to understand his transformation. So Malcolm had changed. Malcolm moved from a gangster to be a religious person, even though the Nation of Islam was not seen to be a bona fide or legitimate uh, movement. The fact there were certain Islamic principles within that which he embraced. What a lot of people don't know about Malcolm X is that when he actually embraced a form of Islam before he went on Hajj, there were certain things that he would commit himself to. Malcolm was an individual that fast every other day. And this is the most dearest fast to Allah. And this was a fast which was done by Dawood alayhi salam every other day. So this is what Malcolm did. He would not eat between meals because he didn't want to upset his wife, you know, if she, if she cooked. If he did have anything between meals, it was usually coffee. So these were just some of his spiritual elements which inspired the people around him. And obviously when he wanted to go on Hajj, he didn't have that type of finance or money because of the issues and problems which he incurred within North America, you know, speaking out the racial injustice, etc. But his devout sister by the name of Ella, she had sponsored his trips abroad and she was also the contributing factor for him to go on Hajj and obviously go on to places like the Middle East and some of the North African East African, North African, also West African countries. I think this is important because we have to look at the role that women play within men's life. And he also, he had a, a strong wife by the name of Betty Shabazz. And Betty was one of those individuals that was able to deal somewhat with the issues and problems of death threats towards her husband, death threats towards her kids. It was a very hostile environment, not just for black people, but even for the ex-family. So these are just some of the things I want you to reflect on, you know. Um, Malcolm was an orator. He was able to speak to the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak, the intelligence and those who were less intelligent within society. He was able to articulate, you know, the reality of the black experience in America, of calling people to the aspect of human rights, not civil rights. Human rights is to be seen as a human. And in the 1950s and 60s, black people were not seen as humans. They were associated and identified as being some kind of ape species. So these are just some of the things I want us to think about. But what I want to leave you with is that knowledge is important. Malcolm, you know, he encouraged knowledge, all his daughters eventually, 
all six of them were educated. His wife became a doctor, even though she brought up those six children, which were all daughters, single-handedly, very little help from the state, very little help from the nation of Islam. So this is what happened. So he had a strong woman in his life in order to carry out most of his teachings and to establish some sort of stability, an element of upward mobility for black people in America, especially his own family. So I just gave a little summary of things and I think this is um, a good start just to get the ball rolling. I, I, you know, there's, you know, there's, I could never do justice to this man's life, but as long as we're left with these few gems of knowledge, its implementation, application, and like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and I'll finish off with this, you know, if you see something that you dislike, you know, you should try to change it with your hands, you know, stop it with your hands. If you can't, speak out against it. If you can't do neither of those, hate it in your heart. And Malcolm was one of those individuals, not only hated in his heart, he did his best to try to change it with his tongue as well as his hands. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.